You're listening to the Back Home Network, presented by Homefield Apparel. So what the games, physical basketball I was at the game, you were there. You, you watched it on my YouTube. Anyway. I saw okay. the game. Yeah, I watched the game. I watched the game. I watched the game. Well, we're here. I'm Bob Motes. Welcome to X's and Joe's, a podcast dedicated to decoding the winning formula in college basketball. And I'm Mike Weemouth. Welcome you to episode eight, Ask Us Anything, recorded on the evening of April 11th, 2024. So, Bob, we're at the end of the college basketball season. Um, what were your thoughts about the uh, the Final Four? You know, it's not every day you get uh, two incredibly rare experiences of a total of a, of a total eclipse as well as a Purdue final appearance in a final game, appearance I, in a final game. I know it's like Book of Revelations kind of stuff, right? I mean, yeah, you throw in Calipari moving on to Kentucky, uh, from Kentucky to Arkansas in the same twenty four hours, and you start thinking to yourself, do I need canned goods, yeah. bottled water, and a bucket to go down to the basement? Yeah. Take the baby, take the dog, take the wife, and we'll wait this thing out because we don't know how it's going to turn out. But. Um, yeah. No, I mean, it, I think for a lot of IU fans, it was kind of this, and and I think it, there was kind of that Armageddon mindset of like, okay, how do we how do we deal with this? Because we really haven't, you know, looked at a Purdue Final Four since the Carter administration, or again, their only other appearance was it was moon related in '69, you know, the year they shot a guy up oh, to the right. moon yeah. to yeah. walk on it. Yeah, NASA did it, but they actually put a Purdue alum up there, but um. Uh, I, without, I, I have to just say, you know, they they, they were they, they were a fun team to watch this year, and they yeah. did a lot of they, they did a lot of cool stuff. But mm. UConn, man, what a team! <laughs> we talked about them plenty of times here, but what a team! Oh yeah, yeah, no, they're they're impressive, and uh, yeah, they definitely fit. Uh, you know, we talk about sweet spot model; they are uh, about as exquisite an example of the sweet spot as you can get. So, so basically, if you were talking about UConn, you're basically saying that he that that he's pretty much hit that hit that the theory right between the running lights. Yeah, uh, he's. Uh, I think I said like uh, two years ago, even before he won the championship, that he's kind of taken over the mantle from uh, Jay Wright in terms of the uh, uh, the guy that's most recruiting towards like a sweet spot sort of uh, orientation. So, yep, and it's and paid hit, off. The, hit the portal pretty well too with both uh, Newton and Spencer. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So again, it's just it was really it's been an interesting few it's been an interesting few weeks and two weeks especially since we've done the uh, so we've done the last pod and uh, yeah. you know it's going to be interesting to kind of keep 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 tabs on the next uh, the next few um, the next few weeks as well as the portal season gets in high gear we know we have some visits coming to Indiana yeah. and across the country um, you know keep keep your eyes on your on your favorite sources of information and whether it's you know pigs or inside the hall or you know some of the other stuff that uh, happens through the IU networks but also you know Trilly Donovan's got a good little group going with this discord as well so you know yeah. the way to check out burner ball yeah. but um really just a and we also found verbal commits right that's another one that that, that we've been finding recently yeah verbal commits does has good stuff i use on3 a little bit too for uh for portal tracking uh, so it's yeah there there's a lot of good resources resources out there so i think so, people should avail themselves of them so so but regardless you know the best part about avoiding armageddon is that we get to look at and buy more home field apparel stuff exactly no it's uh yeah you and i were talking just this week about the uh the eight or nine year old versions of ourselves how much joy we would have seen from like just going on like home field to see the 1983 1984 vintage stuff you see in there specifically i liked the shooting shirts from the 1983 houston cougars basketball team the phi slamma jamma the the cursive um the embroidered cursive phi slamma jamma is written on the back of the jackets i remember specifically watching the 83 final and uh how much i love those uh, those outfits especially just considering Everyone in my school at Davis Park Elementary loved that team. They because remember, no one, no college basketball teams just didn't dunk that much back then. No. And so those, like I remember, all my friends were just all about how fun Houston was to to watch play. So so yeah, definitely check out uh, the uh, the shooting shirts you see from Houston and Georgetown. There's uh, the '84 U- Ewing um, 
vintage uh, Georgetown uh, warm-ups are also pretty cool too. So that it, it, it harkens back to that day where you pack three. You know, it, we 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 had this kind of conversation with the Ed Klingon final game. You know, the the battle of old school centers. And yeah, the match of the titans kind of thing. Harkens back to the day where you know offenses had three guys and you know three offensive players or three defensive players in the rim, and that dribble penetration stopped at a wall of insanity. You yeah. thought some guy was going to get themselves killed going in there, yeah. but uh, you know, oop pass lane. You know, alley oop passes down the lane, dunks, and you know pivot moves. And and again, when we talk about that that era in 1984 and that time of the Final Four, we talk about you know the Indianapolis Colts moving to to Indiana. That's right. And we're also with the end, the NFL draft is coming in the next next few weeks. We're going to be getting the draft and Homefield has a very interesting vintage collection of uh Indianapolis Colts material uh, uh, gear including a homage to the great Hoosier Dome, which it will yeah. always be the Hoosier Dome. Yes, it will never be RCA Dome or any no. other <laughs> No, what was secondary. It, yeah. Yeah. No, there's no, there's no, there's, there's no dog sitting there listening to it. I mean, there's none of that going on, and it will, yeah. you know, yeah, and even call Luke as well. Sometimes let's go to the Hoosier Dome because it's it's close enough. But yeah, no, you know, I that, love I love that T-shirt that uh, you and I, had, uh, you know, uh, texted back to each other. Uh, yeah, I believe it said like 1984 Hoosier Dome and kind of that old like that old electro 80s script print they have. Mm-hmm. So it does remind me of that whole time you know uh, growing up when the colts you know did come to indianapolis and if you if you ever have the chance to go i remember as a kid there was a uh there's a plaque in a room at the columbia club in downtown indianapolis that actually said <laughs> this is the room where ursay met with hudnut and governor Orr. i think at the time governor this bob is, Orr, yeah exactly this is where the deal was basically struck so yeah, it's just uh, it is funny that that time was actually that was like a historical event. The Colts coming to uh, to Indianapolis from Baltimore. So it was like right after my like you know ninth birthday, and I remember that it was like the night of my ninth birthday. And I'm a Bears fan still because you know you you know it, but I mean I kind of married the Bears, love the Colts. But uh, no, I remember you know Hudnut told when he was alive told the story that um, when they brought Bob Ursay, it was Bob Ursay and the yeah. owner of the Colts at the time, Jim's dad. He walked in and saw the blue seats, and I guess they got him because they got him because they were they were the least expensive option. Yeah, they built the stadium with before they got the team. They built the stadium to get the team, and Ursa came in and just kind of said, "Man, this is it. This is where we want to be." So this yeah. place was built for us. So yeah. again, check it out. Um, you have home field apparel, um, and check them out www.homefieldapparel.com. And um, yeah, you know, be sure to be sure to follow them out. on social social media and to give them likes as well, because that helps uh, drive some of their business. Exactly. So, Bob, shall we begin the Inquisition? Let's 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 get this let's get this party started. I would say a big thank you to everybody that submitted questions and as well as submitting questions that you know just just an interaction questions after some of our episodes too. Uh, we're going to get to most of them. I think there's a few that we're going to hold back that are going to kind of help us drive our transfer portal episode. One of the trans, there's going to be several transfer portal episodes, but the but the but one we're going to start doing, we're going to do one um, next, you know, in, in a couple in weeks. Two weeks from now, we'll probably do it. You know, get kind of start that process of how we're evaluating it. But um, no, we really appreciate all the feedback, and we also appreciate the questions, and we hope we do our best to get them answered and 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 um, and and uh, continue the discussion. So yeah, and any ones we don't answer, uh, we promise that at least the ones we don't answer here on the show, we will answer um, through this social thing. media or uh, through Substack and the other places where they are submitted. So um, everyone will get an answer in some way. Yeah, yeah. and we'll try to make it accurate. <laughs> As be- well, yeah, as, as we'll, best as you and I can. We'll do our best. I mean, yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so Jack Blackstone is going to kick us off with a uh, please have Mike explain his scoring system for individual players that pre- that he presented in X's and Joe's a couple of months ago when discussing the portal system and roster construction. I cannot find it. Thanks. Great. Um, so, Jack, thanks for the submission. Um, yeah, so the, the scoring system that I use, it's uh, called box plus minus. Um, you'll typically see it written or discussed as uh, as BPM. And I will typically, on social media, call it just BPM. Uh, basically what uh, box plus minus is, it takes the stats from a player's in-game performance and estimates their 
total contribution in points. It is a point, it's a measure of points. Um, a measure of points from 100 possessions relative to the national average. So it basically means that over 100 um, possessions, it how far above or below the average is this guy contributing in terms of their points? Um, and that could be offensive and defensive. So it's basically a cumulative measure. Um, the, probably the best way to explain this is just to do it by examples. I, being a math nerd, I typically would say, hey, go check out the, the calculation. The calculation for BPM is just absolutely esoteric. It's uh, Even as a math nerd, I, I, I don't even try bother digging it to myself because it is just uh, it's way too complex. Um, so the best explanation is like, let's take a player like Zach Eady. Okay. Zach Eady is a box plus minus 17 player. And Off the seven, charts. Off the charts, Off yeah. The I charts. mean, set, yeah, there, there's usually maybe one or two BPM plus 15 guys in a year. And some some years they don't even have a guy over 15. But um, so he's BPM plus 17. What that means is that over 100 possessions, Zach Eady will have created a 17 point advantage over the national average player for his team, for Purdue. Um, so if you think about that in terms of like the context of a game, there's about 140 possessions in an average game. And so if you have a box plus minus of 17, that 100 possessions gets you to about, let's say, the 12 minute under timeout in the second half, let's say. So what's that saying is that above the above the app, uh, compared to just say like an average replacement, Zach Eady has Purdue with 17 more points than that replacement average player would be. And so if you take that over the course of the game, you know, um, you know, the 140 possessions, that's like Zach Eady has like a 24 point advantage over the, the course of the game in terms of his contribution. So that's massive, obviously, um, you know, in, in a basketball game. The, uh, I, I guess, way to simplify it even further is, and the, people always ask me this question, it's like, okay, well, the numbers, like, if I look at them, what does it matter? Like, what can I in interpret from them? Tell me what what does a good player versus average player look like? So if, if we're talking about, um, let's say, Power 5, Big 10 level um, players, 0 to 3 is like just meh, kind of baseline very average, very mediocre. Three to five is decent. Uh, five to eight is like good. Eight to 10 is getting like kind of the great up towards like, you know, near all conference level. And then anything double digits, 10 and above is like elite. That's like high all conference and, you know, possibly all American level play. Uh, if you're looking for examples, uh, let's say, in the Big Ten, like Malik Renew, he's a 4.4 BPM. Uh, Tony Perkins at Iowa is 5.4. I think Boo Booey was right at 7. Uh, Khalil Ware was 8.5. Uh, Jameer Young from Maryland is like 10.6. And, and Terrence Shannon was 11.5. So you can kind of see like the scale as you go. Like once you get, you know, closer and closer to, you know, double digits, you see like the, the scale of performance, you know, um, arches up. And, the reason I like box plus minus is because it is a measure that is uh, it kind of compares kids uh, across, you know, the, the nation. It's not just looking at within like one conference. It's basically kind of aggregating everyone together into one big pool and basically drawing a line of where the average player is and just measuring them above or below that. So it's 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 fairly predictable in terms of, you know, I can look at a box plus minus um, sheet of of you know on a team and kind of estimate okay even without knowing what the team is and um what you know like uh, what their record is i could like look at one and figure out okay this team is probably about a three seed oh this one is about a five seed based upon their box plus minus and i i do a lot of research based upon bpm so there's no stat that is perfect i mean i i would like to think that there's like some kind of stat out there that says exactly perfectly you know, how strong or weak a player is. There's never going to be one that's going to be 100% perfect, but BPM is probably about as close as you're going to get to that. 
And BPM to me, and and you know, it's and and again, never feel shame in not knowing what an advanced metric is for anybody listening. Sometimes just ask or kind of do some research. Google's a great thing. Going to college, uh, basically, if you go to a sports reference, I believe is where we get uh, yeah. the BPMs we use. But Torvik has their own BPM up there. Pomeroy doesn't use a BPM, but they do offensive ratings and some other things as well that kind of give you some some comparative comparative yeah. statistics. But it's advanced rating, you know, advanced advanced metric type type measures. One reason why I kind of when Mike and I first started talking about doing this, we started talking about what's well, a good measurement for us to kind of look at as we're doing real quick at comparisons on players without getting too far into, you know, percentages of free throw, you know, free throw percentages and whatever. Um, we felt the BPM was a good way for us to do a quick, you can do a quick comparison of players, quick comparison mm-hmm. of teams. Um, it, it's kind of a, it, it's what kind of piques one's interest. So like when you see Jalen hood Scafina, who I think was at an, almost like an average BPM, he was a right around yeah. that zero level. Yeah. And you're going, well, how could such an impactful player be so low in BPM? Well, when you throw his defense into his offense, and then you add the other thing of the inconsistencies he had during his freshman year, where some games he would just light it up for 26 with a bunch of assists, yeah. rebounds. Other games, he was almost on a milk carton from a standpoint of scoring. Yeah. And which there is, you which, have that Which variance. does happen with like talented freshmen sometimes. And, and, and yeah, talented players across the board. Yeah, yeah, but, but really freshmen, yeah, they get that, that rapid variance that, that, so BPM is one of those that really kind of helps you kind of just do a quick shot. And then they kind of let you dig in a little deeper. So you can be like, well, okay, well maybe his three point percentage isn't great, but we can tell that he scores in different ways. He's a freshman going to a sophomore, and we we would expect to see a jump here. Okay, is he maybe shooting like it's um, rice at twenty five percent on free on on three pointers, but he's shooting eighty percent free throws. And if he takes that sophomore jump, you can see his three point percentage improving as well. Yeah. And he's a high BPM player for a freshman. So yeah, exactly. BPMs. There's there's a lot of advanced metrics. It's just one we like to use because it's 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 one of those that we can go through quickly. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, in, in future pods, you know, we'll, we'll reference BPM, but uh, yeah, if people ever have any questions, you know, like this about metrics or any other things that they hear on the pod, yeah, feel free to ask us questions, let us or, know. And even DM us on some of these. That's exactly. Fine yeah, because uh, we don't want anyone to get lost in some of the stuff because we try to keep it simple, but yeah, we understand sometimes this math can get a little bit uh, tricky. So, all of right. Fun. Thanks for the question, Jack. Um, let's see. Go on to the next one. Ross asks, um, based on their research, is there any baseline to best performance based on a coach's tenure at their school relative to the Big Ten? We'll get four new coaches based upon uh, conference expansion and another two with uh, May and Diebler. I know Mike and Bob discuss national success and the window there, but how does conference success measure? It's a it's it's interesting because it's kind of hard for us to tell sometimes because the Big Ten is morphing much like the SEC is morphing much like the Big Twelve is morphing, uh, the Big East hasn't really I don't think they've added other than UConn recently, um, but we're seeing you know, the, the the seismic shifts in the conferences. So the question is how do you I I, I look at it as well, how can you look at what UCLA what um, Probably. you know what they've done mm-hmm. yeah. What they've done, does that translate to Big Ten success? Um, I would say if you look at the teams that are moving from, let's say, the Pac-12 to the Big Ten, one way to kind of look at it is maybe see how they've compared against Big Ten teams. Let's look at that first um, and see, well, have they have they been successful? Have they dictated terms of the game? Are they able to play if, let's say, they're playing Wisconsin – you know, how does that kind of translate? Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is if you're successful at, you know, are they, are they, are they, are they able to, if they're at the top end of that conference, are they beating the lower, the, the lower portions of that conference? That's another possibility. Cause mm-hmm. one thing the big is, is the big is always just, I always call it a stinking pile of average. At least it has been the last few years where you have a whole bunch of teams in the middle. It's like watching one of those. It's like watching Talladega. Yeah. You've got Purdue out there in front, and nobody can catch them. And you got a bunch of cars, and then somebody gets hung out to dry, and they go on a three-game losing streak, and they go from like third to 12th. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, somebody else, and it's it's a it's a constant change. And by the time you hit the tournament, something else, you know, that's where they line up, and they go in the tournament, and then all hell done breaks loose. Exactly. So, the, so it, it's kind of hard to predict that. 
Um, but if you kind of look at if they struggle with everybody in their conference frequently, like they have hot, like, like Oregon's going to be interesting because they have really, really big highs and really, really deep lows. Yeah. The question is going to be, okay, so they may not be as, as safe as a bet as let's say UCLA in a good year where they're usually more consistent in whom the, in who they're beating and, and how they're, how they're, and how they're playing to their prediction levels. Yeah. Um, I would say also real quick about Dusty May. Um, watch his recruiting his first two years. That'll predict the success. Same with Diebler at Ohio State. We'll see how that goes. I mean, Diebler, de- both have you know both have had some success, and May definitely more so. But that that's my take on that. Yeah, no, I agree. And it's I'd say the only other thing I would add to it is that um, one thing I, I typically do, especially when it comes to coaches, and I know Ross was wondering a little bit about coaches. Um, you can take some trans, uh, what you might call transition measures um, that can gauge how how will a coach adjust if they're like moving into like a more competitive market. One thing I like to look at is the coach's performance relative to, let's say, recruiting, how they recruit relative to, let's say, the 20 year average of the program that they're coaching at. So you can look at, say, like uh, like Mick Cronin at UCLA. I, I did some measures on him, and he's recruiting right about where UCLA is all over like a 20-year period. I mean, he's getting basically the same number of like, you know, four stars and top 100 kids per year, as did, you know, looking back to the averages around like, you know, um, Ben Howland and, uh, you know, so, and the better parts of Steve Alford. So that's one thing that I would say that you, you should like take a look at is don't just look at like how a coach performs in terms of like recruiting or winning. Look how they perform relative to what that program actually is, because uh, there's been several times I think coaches will get promoted into a job based upon their performance at the last job. But you notice that the last job that they're at actually was like a more stable program. It's the guys that actually can come in and like elevate the program, let's say five or six wins per year above their uh, their program's average. Those are the ones that actually last and, you know, kind of break through at the next program. So. So thanks, Ross. That was a, that was a great question. I appreciate that. Jacob Hill asks. Does Indiana need a full rebuild? My experience as a fan for the past 25 years is that our best seasons are about two years after abject failure seasons. We admired a mediocrity for so for long stretches. 1994 through night firing, Mike Davis era, second half of the Korean tenure. Is now the time for a full reset where we suck for a year and can rebuild with a class of guys who grow together? Or is that impossible <laughs> in the portal era? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I grew the suckage in there. Um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, good question. Thanks, Jacob. Um, and and this this is one that does get asked uh, in some version or another from, I don't know, I've, I've heard from several people. Uh, I would say in this case, it's probably too late for this staff to try to pull that off. Um, if you just think about like the, the conversation we're having just in this offseason, I can imagine like the blowback you'd get from the public if it, right. it seemed like this staff was essentially taking a gap year on roster construction to come back to competition in say like the 25 26 season well but mike isn't the, isn't the whole point of the i mean because the rebuild usually happens at the very start of a of a, of a, of a tenure exactly yeah i mean if, if, we're, if we're going back to our prior pods yeah that's what the and, honey is for right and we're also looking at building through okay you suck for the year to get your first freshman class and then by year three or four you see the jump yeah yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the, the year, if you're going to do uh, what you suggest, yeah, you really have to do that like in the first year. Because again, we're talking about in when a coach is hired, the whole point of the, re, of the honeymoon period is that fans, the media recruits, they all give you a little bit of a break at the very beginning. So in the first year or two, if you're not necessarily like at where you want to be, they're not going to, you know, recruits are not going to turn their back on you just because you had a bad year in year one. Typically, they will take it out on you if you have a, a worse year and say year three, four and five. That's the whole point of the honeymoon period is like that's the time frame in which it is like that little open window that's available for coaches to retool, restock, do whatever you need to get yourself in a position by a time when the honeymoon ends around, let's say, the end of year two into year three where you are at full speed and are able to, you know, jet forward and 
avoid all of the uh, the negative impacts of underperformance once you're outside of the honeymoon. Because once you're outside of the honeymoon and you're having bad problems in terms of winning and losing, then that's where you have the cascade cycle of the media is jumping on you. Recruits are like turning their back on you. Yeah. And so that's the, that's why the timing of a coaching tenure is so important. And that's why you have to take care of things early rather than later. So and I, I would look at it, does any I need the full rebuild? And I think it's interesting. I'm going to pose this based on what John Calipari walking up to a podium yesterday said. He walks up to a podium in Arkansas and goes, well, I came in to have a team meeting and we have no team. Yeah. And right now, whoever Kentucky's interviewing now or talking to right now, which Billy Donovan is supposedly number three on the list after Scott Drew and, you know, uh, you know, basically two national championship winning coaches told them, no, we, we're, we're OK where we're, we're at. Okay. Yeah. The, those are going to be programs that are going to go through a full rebuild. And the, and the expectation at Kentucky and at Arkansas will be whoever comes in there. Kentucky may end up having to pay ten million a year. That mm-hmm. might be where we're where we're looking at, with the transfer portal, with all the instability. It might be a situation where the new guy comes in and it's going to be okay. You're not going to be able to really quote suck for a year. You're going to have to produce something fairly quickly with what we have. Come in, try to get as many of our guys back that the last guy recruited or the last guy promised to come in. Are you going to bring your team with you? I mean, that's kind of what Schurz is doing at Indiana State, going to St. Yeah. Louis. It, that, that's at least the rumor that a few of those guys are going to pack up and move down I-70 to a bigger city with a big arch. Um, so it's it's really kind of a Wild West approach right now. The market will find equilibrium. But I think the question then becomes, okay, if you're Indiana or – any other program that let's say in a year, two years, four years is making a change. You hopefully have the change in a way where the individual is who's transitioning out is doing it on their own terms. And then you bring in somebody else and you create some sort of an era of stability there. Because I don't, I don't think it's going to be necessarily easy to build a new team from scratch. You get hired on March 31st and the portals open and you're already two weeks behind, maybe more, and you're and you're needing commitments around this time because this is right now where the commitments are starting to pop, yeah. uh, right after that dead period of the Final Four. So I think it is impossible to suck in the portal era, but it's really also hard to build in the portal area. I think Mike's right about mentioning the fact that you know it's really hard for a staff midstream to just say we're going to have to we're going to we're going to we're, we're going to tank and rebuild right now. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what certain programs are going to do with that. Like UConn's losing a lot, but they got a lot coming in. Yeah. And yeah, that's, it's going to be an interesting you're, I think you're right, Jacob. It's going to, you know, it's, it's, I think Indiana would pretty much just, I think if it gets put in that position, it's, it, it can do it. The the program definitely has advantages to do it. It's better percentages there, but it's less than ideal. I think to come in with an empty chest, like Tom Crean did in 2007. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Jeffrey Grinder asks, are we as fans delusional in the expectation that IU will ever achieve relevancy within the conference, let alone nationally? No. We wouldn't be doing this if, the, if we thought otherwise. But Imagine uh, if we answered yes to that. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine the comments Just we made. Just bag it in. Yeah. Go ahead. Start following team handball, club team handball exactly. that's happening at the at the Hyper or the uh, or the Garrett now. Is there what, called, uh, what did it say over the, the entryway to hell in uh, Dante's Inferno? Refresh me. It's been a while since I slept through that class. Abandon all hope, ye who hinter here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think I think I think that Indiana and we're probably going to have an episode where we're going to talk about you know institutional ceilings. Indiana has proved time and time again that it can come back, rise from a phoenix of the ashes, hit the highest level of the program. It's happened on more than one occasion. Um, and I think uh, the relevancy question is with the NIL pool that Indiana is generating, with the facilities and the fan support, I mean – just think of how many podcasts, websites, uh, online communities exist, and not even counting the other ones where basically just how much interest is generated by this program throughout the state. 
and the country for that matter. I mean, watch parties happen all over the United States, all over the world with this program. And part of it's, you know, I think I think it's hard to say that, you know, it can't happen. Um, I don't think it's a delusion by any stretch of the imagination. Now, will it be like it was with Bob Knight where you get three national championships before I before I hit my teenager years? No. That's that's that may not that, don't expect that to necessarily happen, but you can definitely be a program that can be in the mix. And this is one of those programs I think coaches still want to be a part of. Exactly. Yeah, I mean it, it this is one of these areas that uh, is kind of like a, another one of the uh the types of research I do is looking at uh, college sports um especially like the elite programs over history like you know how do programs become elite how do they have dips you know how do they perform relative to uh, other programs and in terms of history you know iu is kind of a weird outlier in terms of being an elite program um you know relative to their level of uh, history resources fan support like you said bob you know media attention is another one um if you look at you know if you look at all sports, um, you know, even like college baseball, college basketball, football, you know, soccer, almost all elite programs have these periods of regression. I mean, like, unless you're like North Carolina basketball from like 1950, whatever, just having like 70 years plus of just like, you know, almost like, you know, constant, you know, success with only like maybe three year blips here and there. Um, you know, the programs are going to have these periods of regression, like Kansas basketball from like 58 to 84, like the, the Dick Harp, Ted Owens era kind of took a step back from like the center stage. And everyone is reasonably familiar with Texas, Nebraska, Oklahoma, USC and football having multi-decade stretches of at least vanilla average performance on the field. But the, the point is, like, in you know, all those programs eventually at some point on a long enough time horizon, typically come back. There's no precedent in college sports where a program that has, let's say, multinational championship winners with multiple coaches over several decades just fall into a permanent rut and stay there. And we have to go back to like something like Army football if we're talking about a permanent um, um sort of resignation towards uh, or relegation towards the, you know, kind of the bottom of college sports. So, so yeah, I, I agree with Bob, you know, and we'll have another podcast at some point that gets a lot more deep into the details about like, again, how does a program become elite and then how they stay there and then how do they have problems of, you know, maintaining that. But um, I does have a lot to offer and there's um, I, I think just getting some institutional alignment, you know, throughout the organiz- throughout the uh, organization uh, that's geared towards, you know, winning in a modern uh within modern college basketball i think it's not quite there at the moment but i think uh you know it's uh, the possibility is certainly there and i would just say this take a look at all, a lot of your blue blood programs multi multi-decade multinational championship winners duke um carolina north carolina kentucky now kansas ucla Kansas doesn't fit the list because they haven't gotten rid of Bill Self yet. But when, when oh, Bill true, Self yeah, leaves, yeah, yeah. those programs right now are on what you could call maybe a watch list and see what happens next. Mm-hmm. You kind of you're hearing a little bit of rumblings out of North Carolina, uh, state of North Carolina after NC State goes to the Final Four. The other two are still, you know, we're we're sitting back with 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 much better seedings. So it's going to be interesting to see how the Blue Bloods respond to a much flatter situation with comp- competition as well as conference realignments. And so this whole idea of relevancy, it may be less, there's, you know, these people sitting in the, on the, on the city, on the Hill and everybody else trying to scroll to get up there. Whereas now it's more of an egalitarian. Okay. This year, this year, this year, sort of thing. It may get a little more dicey, a little more competitive, just based. And just looking at the last few years, you're kind of noticing that to a certain degree, just with who's, who's making it and how far they're making it. Exactly. And with all the football programs now having basketball programs, that whole football school, basketball school is kind of that Change. divide is best basically kind of melting away a bit. So, yeah. Our good friend, John Ringer, who again, we'll, we'll mention him again. Uh, you see the logos and the design of this, of this show is, is, is a big thanks to this. He asked, given the current interest in the portal, who would be your ideal six players to add to next year's team? Thanks. Mm, good question. Thanks, John. Um, ideal. Uh, that's always, yeah, it's kind of tricky because there's there's who you want. There's who you can get. 
And there's the combination of kids that are basically practical that could like fit together. I will go ahead and start throwing some names out there. I really like uh, Ryan Conwell from from ISU. I probably, if I were, if this were a draft, he would probably be my number one draft pick. Uh, as I've said in prior pods, and I'm going to bore you know our listeners again with how I view basketball, attacking kids that can shoot, getting can hit shots from multiple places, that have athleticism, that can drive. Uh, that can rebound, um, that can get to the free throw line, can it hit free throws at a high rate. Uh, Conwell is definitely one of those. He's, uh, if you watch ISU, he's uh, really, I mean, among all of the impressive players from ISU, he's uh, he's the one that kind of, to me, stands out. And I've been looking at thinking, oh man, if that kid came available, he would definitely be one I would go after, you know, pretty quickly. Um, I would look at it from a couple. Uh, IU is going to need a, at least one, probably two guys to kind of fill that four or five role. But really, as Mike's saying, you want drivers, you want guys who can make that sort of thing happen. I mean, I'm looking at the Rice kid out of Washington State and the Carlisle kid out of Stanford as two really interesting guys. Mm-hmm. I mean, if worse comes to worse, Tony Perkins would be good. Um, uh, Connor Hickman, uh, from, I believe Bradley would be good yeah. as well to kind of throw in. You're going to, you know, but I, you know, and, and, and again, you're at least looking, it's going to be interesting to see if they land one of the seven footers, whether it's the, the kid from, um, Arizona, who's taking a visit, Abolo. help me out, Abolo, Aaron Bradshaw, they're talking to, you know, if they can land one of those guys, kind of see how they would fit. But um, it's or also Amari, interesting. Amari Williams from Drexel. Amari Williams. Thank you. That's the third. Yeah, that's the other one. That's the third. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you. but I also know this. It's easier, I think, big guys in the portal are harder to find than guards. Lee, and he, that, that includes lead guards. I think the one, the, the, the highest price, the highest, um, the highest demand are rim protecting centers. IU kind of luck, got lucky with Kalel Ware, and Anthony Walker was a good addition too, obviously. But though, but you, it's hard to expect that because I think bigs are going to be one of those positions, kind of like quarterbacks in the NFL. You want to have develop over a long period of time, yeah. versus getting out of the portal. So, I mean, those those are some names that I mean I think I'm interested in. But I I, I think it's more positionally, and then also once we get a roster, start looking at, and you'll be hearing all of us kind of talk about. What can you do with this group? And will you see some changes? Will you see some adjustments? Will you see, you know, how how is this going to, you know, based on what we've seen in the past versus what we versus and versus what we're seeing throughout the game? What can what can be different? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then and I agree with the list Bob gave. And um, you know, they're probably you're you're if you have six openings, and I don't even know if they're going to fill all six. Um, but let's say if if you've got at least two or three starters, you're trying to like slot in there. Some of the kids are probably going to come in that are not going to be starters or they're going to be like high contributing, let's say bench players. So everyone's kind of staring at like, you know, the top kids at the top list. There's a very good chance that one of the kids that I ends up signing is someone whose name you don't even really know right now. That kind of comes out left field. It might be a kid that just is looking for maybe like 10 minutes at a big 10 school and is, you know, just looking to like make some kind of contribution. So, so don't be surprised if some names like, you know, pop up, you see visits. Um, it doesn't mean that that kid is necessarily at the top of the priority list. It just means that, okay, the staff is kind of going through and thinking about, okay, these kids are kind of slotting in an order. And there's going to be some kids that are maybe at the bottom of the order that we're going to take a look at. So just keep that in mind as you, uh, in the coming weeks, as, uh, more kids are taking visits. On that, let's take a quick break and we'll come back here in about, in a, in a few seconds. Welcome back to X's and Joe's. I'm Mike Weemuth, uh, joined by Coach Bob Motes in our Ask Us Anything podcast episode. Let's move on to our next question from Andy. Let's see, Andy Weissar. I'd love to hear any discussion and thoughts on how widespread the utilization of outside consulting groups slash third-party vendors are brought in to assess different facets of programs. I've heard varying reports recently of analytics groups being brought on to look at shot volume, shot types, uh, systems, and player positioning. Who's leveraging and benefiting from it? I, I think we all heard, you know, Alabama and Nate Oates kind of jumping out and saying he's doing this and brought in an outside firm. 
I, I honestly don't know a lot about who's doing it. I do know what's out there. Just what's available to us is an insane amount of data. You know, it used to be we'd have to do this base. You know, it used to be we we get our stat sheets from Chuck Crab start. You know, giving the scoring at the end of the IU game. You know, we're sitting in, and we would wait after Sing Sing Sing, and then there were you know Chuck Crab. <laughs> then and then I would want to hear the hear the Benny Goodman. Yeah. It's moved on with the with and and the and the ability to now tie video. Like there are sites you can go into. Synergy's great with this, where you can just you want to see thirty two pick and rolls by a, by a player, ball screen actions by a player. You can watch all thirty two of his ball screen actions. Yeah, it, it is like basketball crack, by the way. It, uh, yeah. yeah, and it's an amazing tool for anybody in inside the game in the college game and who studies it. Um. There are others like, you know, you know, even just what's based to you, what you can get off of Torvik and Ken Palm. I mean, for 20 bucks a year, you can get a Ken Palm subscription and get just about anything you need to be able to to be able to adequately assess a couple different players against each other, including game by game data. Yeah. So obviously you're going to have in this world people who are going to you know be able to leverage this market it. a lot of former coaches out there, a lot of former managers out there, trainers who can get with a couple corporate guys, start a small firm. You don't even have to do it. You don't have to buy office space and you can be, you know, flying to a college campus and taking their data and basically saying, here's, you know, basically money balling your way to an advantage. Yeah. Yeah. I like this question, Andy, because um, you're going to be hearing a lot more about analytics in the coming years in college basketball. I mean, I, I guarantee if we're, if we're still here doing this podcast another year or two, we're probably going to be spending maybe whole episodes on analytics. Um, as far as the types of firms, I mean, there's all different types. There's, I mean, some of the names that are, that you hear a lot about, like Bob mentioned Synergy, there's one called HD Intelligence, uh, Jamball Analytics, uh, Just Play Sports Solutions. They do a lot of playbooks, I know. And one of my favorites is called uh, NOAA, N-O-A-H. Um, they are a... They use cameras. They're basically like a, um, they use these special computers that take um, camera shots that where they basically place a camera over the rim and they track shooting. They track the trajectory of shots, um, you know, where your release point is, where it hits on the rim. I mean, they can give you this like very granular detail on players shooting. And the stuff is pretty amazing. I mean, I know in probably like another year or two, it's going to be twice as uh, intricate and um, interesting as the stuff they're putting out now. So yeah, there's all different types and coaches use them differently. I mean, some of them kind of use it as they, they treat them like a consulting firm, like tell us what we need to do uh, to, you know, get X, you know, X number of uh, more shots per game uh, or X number of rebounds, uh, you know, per game. Some look at it like they just want the data that they're looking for. I know Bill Self, I think he uses, um, I'm trying to remember what he uses. I think he uses Jamball and he tries to pull out, let's say like lane touches and things like that. He goes to them and says, look, I don't, I don't need advice. Just tell me the, these numbers. Whereas others actually go to them and say, hey, look, we're actually kind of looking for some, you know, some insight here on, on how to improve things. Yeah, and some some schools actually just have like one internal guru in there. I know M Michigan State's had I think Kevin Pagua there for years. I mean, he runs KPI, which is his own little um, metric index, and he's been doing that for years. As far as teams, yeah, like Bob said, Bama, a lot of SEC teams: Bama, Arkansas, Florida. I know uh, Todd Golden's really big into that stuff. Michigan State, Virginia, uh, BYU's into it. Uh, Jamie Dixon, I know, uses a lot of stuff at TCU. So it, it's, it's really growing. And I know that some of these companies, they have over a hundred um, schools that they're now with and they're growing basically by dozens every year. So it's, uh, it's definitely a growing um, field within the, the, um, the game of basketball. What is your guy's demeanor? Jack Ryan asks, as you watch IU games, are you passionate fans getting angry with the ups and downs? Do you find it hard not to look at the macro and watching games that you spend so much time with the data? Yeah, we, we, we I think we'll keep the PG version of this since Bob and I've watched over 
God, over like a quarter century of games you and I have watched together and uh, watching friends, you know, occasionally break furniture and, and electronics, you know, here and there. So as far as what we do, um, how would you, so I would say here, I'll, the best way to do this, I will describe how Bob um, acts during the game. Bob is like a very calm coach. Um, he's always pointing out, ba- Bob is probably one of the best people to sit around watching a game, looking at the things that you might not notice. Oh man, look at that guy's, you know, saying that cross screen there. Oh man, they're running chin action here. I'm pretty good with that stuff if I'm watching it on replay, because I can like, you know, wind it back and forth. But um, Bob is usually looking, he's doing a lot of looking during the game. So, uh, but not a lot of screaming and um, yeah, I would say, you know, pretty calm and reserved. I appreciate that because nobody has ever called my coach in calm and reserved. In fact, one of my assistants is a Purdue guy who over the past said, you know, I watched Dan Hurley and he reminded me of you. And I will, that could be a great compliment or it could scare the hell out of me. I don't know which. Yeah. Mike and Mike, I will say, yeah, you're incredibly analytical too throughout, you know, throughout the games where it's like, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be talking like we were, we, we, we sat together for the Penn state game Penn state at, at Assembly yeah. Hall. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're actually going back and forth about, look, they can do this against Ace Baldwin, but Baldwin this and, you know, yeah. I I would say I've calmed down while watching IU. I've realized two things. One, I'm not coaching them. No. Um, and it's always better to watch a team you're not coaching if you're looking critically. Because when it's your team, you're incredibly hyper vigilant as to, all right, boys, I know you do 999 things really well, but here's the one thing you didn't do well. And we're going to pounce on that over the next two and hours of your lives. And a bunch of 12 years are going, are we good at this? Yeah, you're good at this, but this is what makes you better. Yeah. Um, and coaches are a little nuts that way anyway. Um, fairly miserable lot when you really get to get to know us um, because mm-hmm. we're always in that that mindset. But um, I don't really focus on the macro during the games, I would say. Mike, I, don't, I, I know you can use the macro pretty quickly to explain what's happening. Yeah, no, I, I would say like on my end, that is, and this is where I, I like Jack's question, I find it impossible not to just be stuck in the macro. Like the, I, I wish I could say, you know, I, I compare it to like taking a film class. If anyone's ever done that before, like in some ways, and I love movies, but like if you take a film class, it, it kind of strips away some of the, I don't know, maybe the magic of the, the viewing experience. Like when you take a film class, you know, you're always aware of sort of like what's going on behind the camera, so to say. So, you know, while everyone in the theater is crying over, you know, DiCaprio sinking into the North Atlantic, you're sitting there and you're thinking, God, I wonder why Cameron didn't use a zoom shot right there. (laughs) Like, like, why didn't he follow him into the water as he's sinking to get another extra second or two of, you know, him disappearing into the black. So that's what it's like when you're just buried in the analytics. Like you watch the games and like you don't know exactly what's going to happen in games, but when you... When you just sort of run through all these scenario plays with the data over years, you kind of know, okay, this team, based upon what I see, they're about a 20 and 10 team. This one's like a 23 and 9 team. And so you know, like, okay, within that, you know, like there's going to be a certain number, let's say like two or three games in the year where they're going to surprise and beat a team that, you know, they probably should. There's going to be three games maybe on the bottom side where they're going to lose to teams that they probably shouldn't. But most of the games are going to fall within a certain um, sort of range of outcomes that you can kind of sort of know with some degree of certainty. So I would say, yeah, um, I wish I could sort of like go back in time, maybe take the blue pill and watch the game the way I did when I was like nine years old, where it's just, hey, you're just kind of enjoying the moment and uh, just uh, taking the game as it is. So, um, But Magnus Polkowski can score 30. Yeah, I, I remember those days. Yeah. Um, I, I will I will close it out with this before we go to the next question. You know, I always describe Mike as a he's a half empty optimist because he knows what you don't have. And he knows that you, he's optimistic that teams can get there and that, you know, if you just do these things, this is what this is where you go successfully. I'm a half full pessimist. I'm like, this is what you got. And I'm pretty sure things just go belly up anyway. So just know that whatever you're trying may not have a good chance of working. If you have the advantage because sometimes the space aliens take a team's brains away the night before. And no, I will say no space jam was not a documentary, but I have seen it enough times to believe that it's the case Um, that, but I think a lot of it just comes down to, you know, the more I think we've interacted with people like that aren't us or aren't our families, we've stopped yelling at the dog 
and we've kind of focused on okay this is okay this is what we're seeing and you can kind of kind of you know and that's i think that's the best way to describe how we're watching yeah exactly no i always like that frame that framing it's uh, i think it's pretty accurate and i think my wife when i explained that to her it's like yeah that's actually you so <laughs> <laughs> all right um linda williamson asks. um just saw an article stating that Kansas offered AJ Store from Wisconsin $750,000 to play, and he is demanding $1 million. With that in mind, what happened to NIL being about repping local businesses, getting a portion of merch sales? Uh, can you explain how this all works and what's being discussed to make things not so crazy? You, Linda, I wanted to, I want, really want to make sure we at least address this one and knowing full well that we're going to go into detail on this uh, during the summer because it's one of those things where what you're seeing is you're actually seeing the free market at its finest. And I think, again, go back to Calipari. We're going to talk about him a little bit because this is a seismic move in the game. As IU fans, you're all gonna. You know, if you're an IU fan, you're gonna appreciate, or especially if you're a Louisville fan or any SEC fan, you're gonna appreciate what I've said. One of the rumors that caught, that popped out with Calipari was he left because Kentucky has too high of academic standards on transfers <laughs> and not enough NIL. Yeah. And at that point, that you're going, yeah. "Where am I living? Who are you people?" Yeah. And and I I'm I'm, I'm thinking, you know, you look at this, you know, so. What happened, and I know about repping local business, getting a portion of merch sales, that sort of, I think that's going to be an integral part of this. And I still think you're going to see kids who are going to market themselves, hustle themselves. For the vast majority of players in college sports, that's what NIL allows them to do. It allows it allows a kid who's a swimmer at Iowa State to go back to his high school and do swimming lessons and do training. That's what it does. The first kid that figures out how to do Zoom fencing lessons at a Northwestern could actually find themselves making a ton of money. Where NIL is really going to be showing, this is 2024, we're going to have a bunch of guys, a bunch of college kids coming over from the United States to go to Paris. They're going to become instant blow-up stars in sports that you're not used to seeing, especially swimming, especially women's gymnastics. Um, these are, you know, wrestling could be a part of this as well. You're going to start seeing those people when they come back. If you see a 17, 18-year-old swimming phenom or diving phenom come back to the United States, and they're going to smack them on a box of Wheaties. They may go to a school like Stanford and be the highest compensated NIL athlete there in a, quote, non-revenue sport. Yeah. You see what NIL is doing for women's basketball. Um, so it's not just the um, the collectives that you're seeing where kids going, I'm going, to, I'm going to, I want $1 million to play for your, for your team. You're worth $750. i am going to go elsewhere. That's that's kind of that's that's kind of the that's the chaff that's being fired out. I think what's really happening is you're actually seeing the ability for athletes to leverage their name, image, likeness. And I will just close out what I'm going to say about this on this. This all started because Mike Shashevsky made a boat, boatload of money on a college basketball game in the mid '90s. And was it Charles? Or, it was Charles O'Bannon, right? Was Ed O'Bannon. It, it was Ed, Ed O'Bannon, O'Bannon believe, yeah. who said, "You're using my name. You're using my number." You're using my body type, you're using my hairstyle, you're using my skill attributes. Coach K is getting the money. EA Sports getting a lot more. He's getting a lot more of this money, and I'm not seeing a dime. And what's worse is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bill Walton, Bobby Wilkerson from the '76 team. All of them were represented in the game. Yeah. Not one of them saw a single penny from the sales of that game. Yeah. And then you go through all the college sports games that EA was doing. Using athletes, not their name, but their image and their likenesses, and then making money, not just and also making money for the institution through the college licensing, uh, this college licensing, um, corp, yeah, the the, yeah. the you know, you know what we're talking yeah. about, yeah. the corporation, they're all getting money, we're not getting anything for it, and it's not like in the case of Bobby Wilkerson, you're paying for his education anymore. The guy's in his in his in his in his, in his pushing seventy. Yeah. So here we go. It's like so. I mean, I think a lot of it was not not so crazy. I think it's going to be hard for the NCAA to do anything about it. I think the way it works right now is you have schools that are now finally able to negotiate with agents who are hopefully representing their athletes' best interests, their clients' best interests, and they're figuring out ways of doing this. And I think eventually what you may see is a system where 
athletes may work for a collective potentially or may get 1099s from the – I think it's already happened. They're getting 1099s from the collective, yeah. hustle on their own, do their own thing. And they're they're not contracted by the institution, but they're contracted here. And then it's a question of how how far will those contracts go on behalf of the collectives and, and on behalf of the entities that are sponsoring them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I was just thinking about when you're talking about swimmers, like – it kind of sucks that Lily King just missed the boat. Oh, just by a minute. Imagine, imagine how much she would have made like coming back in an NIL era from that Olympics, especially doing the finger wag and all that. She would have made You throw her money. on the deck of Donnerpool in Columbus, Indiana at like the early bird meet and you pay her 10 grand. I mean, or no, you don't even pay her. You just basically let her set up Merck. Oh, yeah. I mean, those yeah, kids, I mean, in, yeah. <laughs> doing cl- doing swimming clinics with every young swimmer and, you know, kids would travel for miles around. I mean, and oh, Trey yeah. Galloway and Anthony Leal announced they're doing a they're doing a basketball camp and, you know, you know that today, yeah. throughout throughout social media. So, yeah. you know, it's it's a cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. And Linda, I'll say that uh, just Bob answered it well, just like say that it's ever changing. Uh, you know, whatever we talk about now, I guarantee you is going to be obsolete another like six months because it's just moving that fast. I mean, it's high, highly possible that athletes could be technically, I mean, they're kind of moving towards being employees as like in, in the in the true sense of what an actual worker is. Uh, you may see some unionization taking place, mm-hmm. I guess, with the, the Dartmouth case um, that has already, uh, I think it's already been adjudicated. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be interesting. And uh, just as a, you know, a person that's worked in human resources before, I can imagine what a union representation is going to look like for a college basketball team. Like there's, there's things like called Weingarten rights, which basically means that if a person's under investigation and they're in a union, they can have a union rep with them during the investigation. So I can imagine a coach like bringing a kid in saying, Hey, did you, uh, did you maybe smoke weed, you know, in your dorm the other day? I'm not going to answer that. I will have my union rep come in and talk to you, coach. I'm not going to be part of this just one-on-one. So yeah, it's going to be really interesting. There's going to be some, uh, cases that are going to get, um, very intricate, I think, in terms of what we're used to in college basketball. So in 30 seconds, I'll just say that I think institutions are going to have to confront the fact that their graduate students are looking to unionize and there may be some ways for these to be jointly looked at. The other thing I will say as a political reality in this country is that I think uh, both parties don't agree on much of anything except one thing. Uh, the NCAA doesn't need to be doing what they're doing. And so anytime the NCAA asks them for some sort of act of Congress or act of a legislature, the first words are pound sand. Yeah, exactly. So it's going to have to be done that way. Yeah. I'm gonna. Hey, was, they, they're, they're, hey finally, uh, the NCAA is bringing. Uh, they're bringing and Democrats America, together. All they're right. bringing <laughs> America together. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Gold star. Jack Blackstone asked, "I'm curious if Mike Weemouth's expertise is used professionally, reimbursement by teams, leagues, coaches, ads, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, at either collegiate or professional level, and in what way?" Um. Thanks, Jack, for the question. Answer: No. Um. I'm not getting paid in any way. Um. There's um. I guess there's some ways to make cash all this, but it's not like, you know, in any formal, you know, compensation arrangement with, a, you know, with a school or a team. Uh, frankly, a lot of the work I do, you know, has probably more applicability in gambling, frankly. And I'm I'm not a huge gambler, but occasionally I will like, you know, make bets on, you know, things that uh, that uh, I do for sports now that obviously it's legal. Um because there, you know, there's some things that, you know, we're, we work on here that have some predictive value, like, you know, let's say like the sweet spot analysis I've done before about, you know, the uh, the ability to look at a roster and predict, um, you know, what, whether a team's roster, you know, aligns with uh, historically what uh, national championship rosters look like, you know, in terms of like recruit rankings and uh, BPM um, tracking and all the things we talked about, I think, in episode uh, one or two. Um, yeah, but if you had gone back, let's say like 10 years ago and you just started betting on, uh, the, the national championship winner at, at the time at which let's say the, uh, the, uh, the brackets came out and you just made it like a futures bet and you just bet on the NCAA tournament teams, let's say the four seen it above that had the most sweet spot kids on their, on their team, that bet if you just kept made it every single year would pay off pretty handsomely um, over the course of like a 10 year period. So, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's not, um, 
there, there's some, some, I guess, like financial value in some of the stuff that we're doing here. But, um, but no, we are not uh, being employed or paid in any other way. But uh, certainly, uh, certainly pretty appreciate the question being asked. Jack, I'll put it this way. If I ever did this for real, like I said, I want to make this my profession. If I ever did this at the high school level, my first phone call would be to Mike. I would fly him out here on my expense, wherever I'm coaching. And I would basically pick his brain for 12 hours. I'd probably have him in tryouts. I would probably, I would probably have his eye in that. Um, there have been few people I've encountered in the game that are as knowledgeable about individual players, their attributes, their strengths, their weaknesses, what they're capable of doing, what they're incapable of doing than Mike Weemoth. Um, I've done this now in 25 plus years. I've, I've, I've taught, I've, I've, I've worked obviously with younger kids, but Obviously, I took to coaches on higher levels because I want to learn where they're going. I get a chance to help them out whenever I get a chance to, whenever I get the occasion to, to be of assistance. But uh, yeah, he could do this professionally. I think part of the thing you got to realize with this game is, first off, it's a very fickle game. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of stress. Um, even at, you know, Even when you're only getting paid like 800, 900 bucks to coach an elementary school team, it takes a lot of your time. You do this for real. It's not. It's a lifestyle choice, and that's the other part of this is that it's 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 a definite lifestyle choice. But yeah, I mean, it does, it surprises me he's not got an offer yet from somebody sitting at a at a D two school saying, "Hey, can you come in and check us out? We'll pay it. We'll pay a five grand, or we'll <laughs> we'll give you a beer money or something." I mean, to do this. So that's, that's sweet of you to say, Bob. Thank you. Yeah. It is. But and remember, we're 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 trying to get other people within our friend group, like a aka. A- Tony Adrani hired in places. So that that's our pro that's priority one right now in terms that of that really you know, is. Yeah. <laughs> Tony get, get Tony hired first and then he, take he it off the yeah, rest later. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next question. Pearson asks, I feel like we continue to have lineup issues, essentially making player players play out of what I feel is the position they should be playing in. I feel like we might have three full uh, three fours. Um, thoughts on Malik at the five, Mbako at the four, and Tucker at the three, or vice versa with Tucker and Mbako. We are four heavy once again, and it's driving me crazy. So, again, everybody kind of has their looks of what they want to do, and I mean, I think Mike Woodson does like size, he likes length. I think that there is there is a case that can be made for two stretch fours and a rim protecting center along with two effective penetrating shooting guards. Um, I think part of it's just a matter of getting all five of those pieces together uh, to look more like call it San Antonio (laughs) for lack of a better term um, versus looking like uh, golden state. The the, the problem is finding long-term college players who are 6'7 to 6'8, six, 6'9, six, who can be an effective college wing. <clears throat> then you got to find two of them, and then you got to find the seven footer to put in the middle. The, I think a lot of this is, I, I, and I, I, I do think that there is a situation where if you're looking at a lot of programs, they would have Malik Renew playing as a small ball center. Um, I think Mbako, I think Ant Wright hit the nail on the head a year ago when he was saying if they play him as a stretch four, you also have to realize I'm a guy that doesn't like position numbers. I mean, I find position numbers to be, you know, yeah, morally re- reprehensible. No. Um, I like attributes. And I think that, you know, you got to have at least three and a half guys that can hit from beyond the arc consistently. I say three and a half because you can have one guy's a little shaky. And you have to have these other on the floor. You have at least to have three guys that can drive the ball, four guys that can really attack a closeout, and at least one guy, probably multiples, that can get up above the rim um, effectively. Um, That's offensively. Defensively, you need to make sure that you have everybody can guard their yard. You want to be able to switch at least one through three, if not one through four. Why did UConn beat Purdue? They could switch one through four, and they could single cover Edie. They're, you know, talk about the offense. Yep, all that was there. They attacked. They they did exactly what they were supposed to do. But because they could defend them a certain way, they couldn't go anywhere. And you, it's really hard to do that with players of size. I'm just going to put it out there just because those those players are not available in the numbers. It's a lot easier to find a bunch of guys who are 6'5", 6'6", than it is to find a bunch of guys who are 6'7", 6'8", who are incredibly, who are, who, who have the same skill sets. 
Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If you think about it, it's like um, uh, what you said, Bob, is sort of that adaptability, not only in terms of, you know, the position, but just within the play, like, okay, I can guard this guy, but then I can guard the guy that's a little bit shorter and faster, or I can guard the guy that's, you know, a little bit taller and stronger. And I, I think sometimes when you recruit players, I mean, again, you'll, you'll hear a lot of us on these, you know, podcasts talk about fit so often. And it's like, you know, why, why, why do you guys talk about fit in terms of, you know, offense? Why are you just talking about, you know, how good they are? So much of what makes a team functional, like, you know, let's say that is allows them to operate at full operational capacity is this idea of just them fitting in to what the team is basically trying to do and also making sure that there's no over not too much overlap that they're basically you can say that okay there's enough guys in this team going to guard a certain kind of player on the other team that they can or exploit uh different um defenses uh, that you know uh, different teams throw at them that's again like what bob said about yukon is that they're just so adaptable they have so many guys that are just can switch off they can take a point guard and they can switch off to the three just as and guard them just as effectively as they did, you know, with the guy they were just guarding before. And so if you do have some players where you're kind of sliding them the wrong, let's say the suboptimal spot for them, it creates, it has the potential to create kind of a cascade effect. So let's say you play renew at the four, which is by itself, it's not necessarily a problem, but if you have renew and then you bring in Baco in and Baco probably and again, my opinion, and Ant Wright and some others, you know, think that he likely is a four. But if but if Renew's already there, then let's say you slide him down the three. He can play the three, but not as optimally as he can probably at the four. But then you play him at the three, then Galloway's sitting there, and maybe Galloway belongs at the three. And so if he's blocked, then he has to slide down into the one or two. Again, he can play there. But can you play optimally there? And so that's when we talk about, you know, these issues of in fit and a roster construction. It's like you're trying to, again, above just getting like really talented players with high skills, you're trying to get them in such a way so that they're slotting into the position that they can most optimally, um, you know, perform for the team and to, you know, basically make um make the team the kind of roster or make or design the kind of roster that you see that's making those kind of late runs like Purdue, like UConn, like Houston. And so I would say that's something that maybe fans don't focus on quite enough, but uh, it's something that, you know, really creates such a huge role in, uh, you know, who's basically advancing and who's uh, dropping out early in the tournament. And there's a lot you can do schematically also to, to kind of mitigate that a little more. And that, that's another question I think we're going to probably address over the offseason a little bit, like some of the schematics that some teams are running with maybe some un, unconventional lineups. Um, on that, let's take a, br- a quick break and we'll come right back. Welcome back to X's and Joe's. I'm Mike Weymouth, joined by Coach Bob Motes in our Ask Us Anything episode. So we met this guy at the meetup. Nice guy, this Jared Morris. We we met him before. Is he the right? Texas? I, is he the tall Texas guy we met? The guy, he's tall. Yeah, he's tall from Texas. Nice cow, guy. Cow, cowboy hat and everything. Yeah, the whole the whole shooting match had the spurs and the boots to match. I mean, he's, exactly. Yeah. Looked like a Gene. He looked like Gene Autry. He know, looked like Gene Texas. Autry. Yeah, yeah, with the guitar too. Um, <laughs> Jared asks us, our good friend Jared asks us, what is your best historical analogy for proud Indiana fans having to sit here idly while Purdue plays in the Final Four and Indiana State becomes the national darling during the NIT run? Hmm. Good question, Jared. Um, Let's say, let's say that um, your best historical analogy. Uh, I think you used the word proud um, and I think that's probably the optimum word to use in this kind of scenario. I mean, there in history, there are these what we call wars of prestige between countries that fight over issues, of, let's say, like respect and global admiration, not for, let's say, land and treasure. I mean, you could go back and we could go back really far, right, Bob? I mean, in terms of <laughs> those kind of wars, I mean, King Men- Menelaus, you know, of Sparta, he was very butthurt mm. over Helen you know, sailing off with the Trojans. So we could, uh, (laughs) you could use that kind of example. I would say with Purdue going to the final four and IU fans sitting at home watching that, 
maybe the space race between the U.S. and the Soviet Union would be a good example. Um, the Final Four is like the Soviets, you know, being the first to launch a satellite into orbit, you know, Sputnik. And we definitely saw, you know, the, the U.S. at that time saw themselves as like the alpha in the rivalry, the way maybe IU does. And so seeing your rival that you think you are better than crossing a threshold um, just causes a degree of panic and sort of despair, you know, it, within um, – in in just witnessing that as uh, as IU watched Purdue having that success at as like America had their Sputnik moment as they said back in the sixties, um, and yeah, I, I remember like just reading you know, stories at the time from the sixties, like wait a minute, those drunken commies can't beat us in space, and it kind of caused America to get into this like you know frenzy, like okay, we're going to start spending money, we're going to uh, you know jump up of uh, our um, investment in you know technology and research so so yeah it'll be interesting if it has that kind of catalytic effect you know with us but um yeah that's probably the number one i can think of in terms of jealousy the the other like more recent one would be let's say north korea's response to south korea being awarded the uh, 1988 summer olympics um, you can go research it yourself, but it's rare to say that a country was actually having a national tantrum over their neighbor's success. And literally North Korea was having a, a kind of freak out when South Korea got the uh, the Olympics. So so those are two ones I can think of off the top of my head. I, I want to preface this by saying Indiana State become the national door on the NIT run. I, I think I texted Mike and a couple other people and I said, I'm almost in tears watching them almost win that game because I was thinking about my parents and my and all their oh, yeah. friends and the people yeah. up there. So yeah, Indiana State was a real. It was it was a kick watching them just because it, they've always kind of felt like you know your favorite cousin, you know. Yeah. But for Purdue, after I let the primal scream out of the backyard and the dog looked at me <laughs> weird and my in laws basically tried to hide my kid from me. <laughs> I mean, I think I sent another text message that said, "I now know what it feels like to to have been a czarist, you know, a member of the, a member of kind of the the nobility class in Russia in 1918, <laughs> yeah, where the Bolsheviks take over. It's like watching that scene from Shivago when he returns home, and all of a sudden he his wife is up in the bedroom with the father in law smoking the yeah. last cigar in Moscow. <laughs> the kid, yeah. you know, she's got the last piece of meat that she's scrounged from God knows where yeah. and to have a final meal as he gets back from world war one. And there's like an entire village of people living in this house, looking at him like he's done something wrong. Yeah. You're all welcome. Of course it is. It's ours comrade. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh crap. I walked into a target in Columbus and I could just see Purdue shirts all around me. And exactly. I said, Oh shit. This is this isn't going to end well for me. I didn't wear IU gear for a week. I'm like, I, I think they're gonna they're gonna mock me because that's what we do, right? No, I mean it's exactly. like, I I I mean it was just and um, uh, you're just hoping that you know you're, you're debating. Do I leave the state? Do I stay? I mean, are they going to take all my things? It's or you know the other one was you know I think of the Godfather two and the Havana scene of do we need to get on boats and head to Miami? It yeah. because you just can tell the rioting in the streets is so bad. You think like Michael Corleone with your head you know yeah. looking out to just think am I going to live through this? They're smashing the parking meters in my and and my slot machines out of my casinos. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's my best historical analogy was absolute just like the world's been turned upside down and I'm not sure how we're going to get through this. Yeah. Which leads us to the next question. Yeah. Yeah, so Bryce asks, what are the effects on IU, both negative and positive, with Purdue making a run to the Final Four for the first time in 44 years? Severe self-reflection. <laughs> I that's mean, a, that's a good way to put it. Uh, almost painful, almost going into the confessional booth and confessing your sins, reflecting upon your life. You're going to the top of the mountain to meditate, to look at yourself and go, what happened? Knowing that it was going to happen. Yeah. Um, at some point, it was inevitable with as good as Purdue has been since 1980 that they were going to, that the stars would align, the eclipse would happen, and it did. And they would make it to the final four and they made it. Um, the, so the, the, that's, if there's a positive, it's the fact that it's like, okay, let's 
keep the conversation going because if there's been one thing we find when Purdue has uh, some success, Piggy Lambert goes and gets a Helms Trophy, John Wooden decides to become a coach, and all of a sudden, Indiana brings in Branch McCracken and becomes a national power. They go to the final game in 69, lose to UCLA by 20. Bob Knight comes in a year later after the player revolt, and IU becomes a national power. After 80, you know, there was a resurgence for IU. I mean, you got to think that these programs kind of work well in tandem together. And that, obviously, the negative is you look at the worst case scenario, which is, well, we could lose the state and all these kids are going to get excited about Purdue basketball. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the. Yes, that, that that potentiality is much more of a long term, you know, um, threat. But yeah, certainly, I mean, the the erosion, if you think about it, like the erosion of the advantages that uh, can can take place, can really sort of accelerate when you see one team that maybe has kind of been like you know considered sort of lower on the totem pole starts like you know surpassing the 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 team that uh, has let's say like certain advantages in terms of like media attention and you know and size of the fan base yeah i, I would say that uh, the 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 potential you know we say positive and negatives let's say i'll frame this in terms of a potential positive is that typically when you see a program that is a rival that that starts having success and sort of like leapfrogs like uh, you know their rival. That second that rival that's been re- leapfrogged typically will have you know kind of a screw this moment, where they basically say, okay, we've kind of took the took our eye off the ball. We have been a little bit complacent. Now we're going to basically start prioritizing winning. And when I say like the screw it moment, it is literally like a they, you know they will always say screw this. We're going to start making. You know, we're going to start hiring differently. We're going to start like approaching in terms of how we fund things differently. You see it in football all the time where one program does a little bit better and then the, the fans, you know, go crazy. And then the athletic director, you know, sometimes they should bring a new athletic director who has a very like, you know, aggressive approach and says, okay, we're going to like, you know, do this uh, differently. Again, we're not saying that's going to happen like in this case. We're saying that what typically happens is that the pressure builds from below is that the fan bases start, you know, like lighting the fire a little bit higher than they did before. Once they see their rivals start to have that kind of success. It's what we talked about in the, the rivalry podcast we had, you know, just a few weeks ago, we talk about that whole notion of social comparison theory. Why do fans go nuts when their, their rivals do well is because they feel like their relative position in, you know, how they like view themselves with within sports is now lowered relative to, their other fans because again we talk people in indiana talk to purdue fans and you know they can get teased they can get uh, those um joking mocking texts from you know their their nephew that's uh, sitting at purdue as a freshman so it's that kind of stuff that just causes people to get uh, galvanized to start saying okay yeah we're, we're there are things that we're going to do now going forward they're going to be different and there's going to be just higher and higher demands in terms of Okay, what do we expect from the coaches? What do we expect from the administration? So that is the potential change that can happen. But again, it doesn't guarantee that's going to happen or that's going to happen in a very specific period of time. So our, so our friend South Bend Hoosier, who we've uh, interacted with over the years, reminded us one such interaction. <laughs> one Pigs Monday chat, I think the final three people were me, Bob, and Mike. And, uh, you know, after I was, hours. I was almost- I was kind of enjoying and dreading the, the possibility. Of this ah, <laughs> and randomly, 70s music came up. I'll offer this question up for the podcast to consider. What is the greatest decade for rock? And why is Mike wrong saying it's not the 70s? Mike, justify yourself. Yeah. Um, remind me about that was like the pandemic, right? That was like three or four years ago. Probably. I okay. Yeah. But I mean, we but see you and I have been having this conversation. I even sent you a text message of a version of MacArthur Park being done by uh, <laughs> Chet Akins and Jerry Reed. It's like. Oh, yeah. look at this fresh hell for you, because I know how much you love MacArthur Park. Yeah, yeah. Go Google or just go YouTube MacArthur Park kids if you haven't you haven't seen that one. So yeah. Waylon Jennings <laughs> has a version. It's not just the Donna, Richard Donna Harris Summer double. 
And I love the Donna song. I mean, I love most of them. They're actually, I, 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 you just don't listen to the lyrics, but go ahead. Rich, Richard Harris did the original one. And I, I swear, just knowing how much he and Peter O'Toole were drunk throughout most of the 70s, I just assumed that he was completely wasted when he signed the contract to sing that song. So. I, I, I think it's kind of like, it's, 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 it's kind of like the thing. It's like the Holy Grail. Everybody wants to go pursue it. And it's like trying to just try it. You know, let's just do MacArthur Park. Hell Sinatra did it. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I don't, but see, I don't know. I never understood your, your, why you've never felt, I mean, I understand Captain and Tennille. Muskrat love is a, is a, is a train wreck. I also understand there was so much happening in the seventies that you had such abominations as the Ethel Merman disco album. (laughs) It exists. Check it out. I actually have it to use for torture. I also know that I've used Barry Manilow to clear my apartment out for parties when the beer ran out. Yeah. Nothing works like I, Mandy I at three thirty in the morning. I think I've been at one of those parties when you did. That. I think you were the first to hit the door. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But no, I, I, just, here, here's ahead. my yeah. Here's my recollection. I think we were discussing in South Bend Hoosier. Maybe he can like you know chime in later on. You know, um, that's you know and just correct us if I'm wrong. I remember that we were having a conversation. It was just like one at the end of Pig's chat. If you ever know, like there's just nothing going on. People are just like run out of conversation about recruiting and all that. And I think someone's made some comment about like, oh, well, you know, the, they're talking about decades and they're debating like, oh, 80s music, 60s music. And I said, well, you know, the 70s, I mean, it was the greatest decade for movies, but less so for music. And oh, my God, you can almost hear people's bell bottoms getting ruffled over what I said about just implying that maybe 70s music was a little I bit, was probably uh, listening to Bell Bottom Blues done by Derek and the Dominoes, one of the greatest super bands ever to walk <laughs> the face of the earth. Keep going. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, people are like, well, "What do you mean the '70s music wasn't great? You know, why would you say that?" So yeah, uh, that's one of those I just would feel like, "Oh God, I'm getting caught into this this vortex of a debate that I just don't want to get involved in." <laughs> it was like I woke up thinking, like, yeah. no one wakes up thinking, like, "Yeah, please let me get in a fight with the people who still have a a, a fetish for pet rocks and ABBA." <laughs> so, oh so. no, or or, or, or still, or, or again, it's just Fleetwood Mac rumors. How can you, ah? Uh. But I think, I, I, yeah, well, yeah. Well, here, here's the thing. Like, I will, I will stipulate this. I, I made the comparison to the '60s, and I said, "Look, like there, there are days in there are weeks in the 1960s." And I, I was like looking this up. Do you know that I know. the day, the day that "Help" by the Beatles was dropped? It was like July something. It was like July 19th, 19. Well, 1965. Oh, 65. Those next, Okay. The next day. Bob Dylan's like a Rolling Stone drops. And like seven days before that, I think good vibrations dropped. I'm thinking like, my God, you had a decade where literally like multiple all time top 100 rock songs are just dropping just like one by one, literally within the course of a week. And then you go forward into the 70s. And clearly I can say just based upon looking at like the the, uh, top 500 uh, Rolling Stone magazine, you know, all-time rock songs that the, the pace of let's say the best songs definitely dipped in the 1970s. That's all I said. And I said that maybe a few of the, uh, the worst of the seventies, like Muskrat love and um, uh, was it a disco duck and all the other, you know, <laughs> auditory offensive, you know, songs that, uh, you know, tend to permeate the seventies, you know, let's, kind, let's just all agree. Shape. We can agree. If it's one thing we can agree on, Rick D should never, re- never have recorded any music whatsoever. You know, it was not. Pe- people should like, yeah. If you're watching this, like, just write down, go YouTube Disco Duck, and this will give you a, a, a clear illustration of like what passed for music sometimes in the 1970s. So, and then oh. I would also say for this for the 60s. Okay, first off, it's like it's this, the 70s have nothing on the late 40s and the Mitch Miller running Columbia into the ground years. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, just uh, I can't remember. I'll, I'll put this in a Discord. I'll put it in the Substack or something where there was this blonde woman who sang a duet with Sinatra that was one of the most god awful songs ever written. I think Sinatra should have destroyed the Masters, but he couldn't get his hands on them. I mean, there's <laughs> there there's a lot of bad stuff from from various eras of music. But I will say, in the '60s, you had a good chance of getting you know whether it was Vic Damone or Frank Sinatra or Tony Bennett or Dean Martin in with the Beatles on a top forty. And so it's really, you know, you look at the top, you know, and you, and you even go into the seventies, you'll see some of that as well, where it's like, just, just amazingly, 
amazing amounts of music that was just being created at that time. And, um, and again, if you're in the country, the outlaws in 76, hell of an album, anything yeah. done by Dolly Parton, late seventies, great albums. I mean, yeah. you just, you can check it out. So Mike, yeah. I'll, I'll cut you some slack on this. I understand. Okay. I know where you're going with it, but at the same time, it's still going to bust your chops every uh, once in a while. I like know. This. And, and our, and our pal South Bend Hoosier, he's a great guy. You know, you, you see him a lot around and, um, I use social media. Yeah, South Bend, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to offend anybody by my comments. I will <laughs> formally apologize here. Um, I, I promise I'll send you the Captain and Tennille, you know, greatest hits, A-track box set, you know, as my apology. So <laughs> I, I will make amends with you, I promise. The live version of Muskrat Love. <laughs> exactly. Did, did you know, yeah, before we move on, did you know that they play that at the White House when uh, Queen Elizabeth visited and it just totally freaked her out? No. Go I yeah, didn't. go look it up. Just just Google Muskrat Love and, and Queen Elizabeth. And was this love. was this the Ford administration or the Carter administration? I, well, I think it was early, so I think it would have been the Ford administration, I believe. Oh jeez. So, yeah. No oh, man. So, okay. <laughs> oh man. Moving on. So Long Island Hoosier asks, uh, in the top performing teams, are there any clear trends with regard to positional size leading to more wins? I would say that the last you know Take North Carolina 2017 out of the equation. Um, I think that you 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 do see usually centers at that six nine to six ten to six eleven. If you're looking at national champions, uh, although Houston made hell with the six seven six eight guys as their as their front line. Um, I I this was this year. Um, you know, look at Baylor was was shorter than your than usual when they won in 2022. Or 2021, sorry, when they won it in 2021, but they also were lengthy. They also shot the ball extremely well and could drive at every position. It seemed like. Um, I think I do think that there is something to be said for having sm- uh, that six four, six five, six six person at the as kind of your mid guy, what we call a three. Um, your your small wing should be you know I think we're seeing teams that are being successful and think the same thing's true of the Castle Kid out of UConn is about yeah. six six right six six yeah. yeah yeah but I I also think at the same time that you know you're looking at you know what Purdue had at six foot six one six four you know there there's other attributes but I think from a size standpoint would you agree with that Mike I mean I I, I think it's where it's hardest for us to find a team that's had big wings that has been successful since Carolina 2017. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I've, I've in preparation for this, I actually kind of looked into it and uh, that most of the research of late about like size has been reasonably inconclusive. Um, I, I know like Cal Berkeley did a study on wingspans a few years ago and they said there was some incremental, um, uh, correlation to success with that in terms of like, you know, with, you know, paired with, ath- you know, athleticism that, yeah, athleticism plus uh, uh, wingspan really does, uh, you know, have some correlation to winning. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's always that kind of weird trade off that you get between, let's say, skill and some kind of physical attribute. And ideally, like, you know, you see teams that just are kind of like, you know, like wavering in between like a certain um, sort of like middle range of, high skill with let's say like high athleticism and there's some kind of trade-off in one direction or the other like uh you look at baylor uh you know 2021 they were a little bit let's say on the shorter skinnier side um of the ledger but they just shot so well and then you look at yukon they were not quite as good as three-point shooters um as let's say that baylor team but they're just longer and they could get in the lane much much easier so so you're right it, it's kind of like there's no like one answer because different teams are just maximizing in different ways i mean obviously you have to have some kind of advantage um over teams whether it's like you know physicality or skill to be in like an elite program but yeah i mean i would say that the the only thing i can think of that might have some trackability is I've, I've theorized for a while that when teams have, let's say very exaggerated differences in terms of say length and height, particularly let's say in the backcourt that I've noticed that there've been some cases where you see like there's a, a strong, a pretty strong correlation, especially in the tournament. And you think about it, again, uh, the game we saw on Monday, UConn and Purdue, I think UConn had like a 10 inch advantage in the backcourt 
over Purdue in terms of like aggregated height. Like you said, Bob, I think it was like Castle is six six, Newton six five, and Spencer's around six five. Versus Purdue, it's like six zero, oh, six six one, and six four. And you think about, of course, like the game no one will stop talking about at IU is the IU Syracuse game. You think mm-hmm. about the the size disadvantage between um, Yogi Ferrell and Jordy Holes versus that Syracuse team where their point guard was six, seven with like, you know, seven plus wingspan. So there, there's a little bit, I think of some, um, some relationship there, but uh, you know, like, like Bob says, it's a little bit more complex because there's a lot of variables that are kind of going into and, all that. And I would say if you're taller and this is where the, you know, where it gets interesting is where do you draw your help lines and, you know, whether it's your, your, your frontline help, which is kind of where, you know, the, the high end or the or the backside level two help where it's just kind of you know closer to the baseline um i would say if you're bigger it makes more sense to move your help line further from the ball like more lane lane or outside the lane so you can do be quicker on closeouts so you can use your length to an advantage yeah. which then puts a lot more pressure on your rim protection and puts a lot more pressure on your on your guard uh, on, on on the who's guarding the ball um, it impacts your switching, obviously, because if I see a, a, a person that I think we can, that I, if I get my point guard or a driver switched on, I can take advantage of that person. Um, then that's a lot of that kind of just factors in. And the question is going to be, as you start seeing teams, if you do see teams that continue to try to find ways to go big, who may try to replicate what Purdue Purdue really wasn't that big except for Zach Eady, so keep that in mind. Mm-hmm. Purdue wasn't exactly like, you know, it wasn't like they had a front line of 6'9 six, six, to 7'4. Six, to, to mm-hmm. um, but I, I think that there's going to be that schematic question of as the game has kind of evolved into the direction where, after the charge, we talked about it last episode, but watching where those help lines are, and I think IU did more of that this year, moving the guy more off the nail and kind of cl- closing down or shortening some of their closeouts and just trusting the guy with the ball to be a little more effective. The other thing I would say about positional size is if you don't have solid rim protection, then how much can, you know, can you get guys who can play as your post player? They can throw up multiple ball screen coverages, yeah. not just drop or not just on the ball or on the level or, you know, in that sort of hedge, hard hedge, or even the, 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 the trap or jump. Can you find guys like, can you find guys that can do more of that, that you can continue to adjust your ball screen coverages to and handoff coverages as well to just really force action. So that, I mean, I think there's some trends there. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that, that that's that, 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 that takes it. So Bryce asked another one. This is, you know, one of our favorite questions about coaching tenures. Previously coaches that end up being coming successful would normally have payoff years and years four and five of their tenure with the portal and NIL. It now seems that number of years until they see payoff should be lessened. Has the transfer portal and NIL changed the number of years it takes to see payoff years and have these two factors made it more demanding on coaches to be successful earlier or else they may get fired sooner? Um, good question, Bryce. Uh, simple answer. True. Or yes. Um, in the golden day, in the olden days, when we would talk about coaching tenures, um, you know, the, the coaching hire always was treated a little bit like a presidential term. It was like, unless the guy broke, grossly broke the law, you know, he gets four years. And you, you see fans, you know, on like the, the early version of, let's say, Peaks and the other like message boards at other schools, there was always just this assumption like, okay, well, it's only year two. So, you know, I know things aren't going so great. Let's give this guy some chance. Once we get to year four, then we'll make a decision. Now, like what you say with the um, with an IL and with the portal coming in, it's just changed the timeline at which programs are now really starting to make critical decisions and judgments about you know the performance of their coaches. I think, especially in examples of let's say Kansas State and Missouri last year, I think those two examples just totally blew the traditional model out of the water in terms of expectations. I mean, we saw at those two schools, they're not like super um, elite or super like um, rich programs in terms of like, you know, the resources, but they within one year could just go into the portal and, you know, put together a roster that could get them to the NCAA tournament. I think now you see many more programs that are just pointing to that as an example 
You see fans on message boards saying, well, we're not going to give them four years anymore. Look what Kansas State and Missouri did. So I think you're right. That's why I know Kenny Payne at Louisville was probably like the perfect example of what you know we talk about uh, here with the chip stack theory, that coaching tenures are no longer measured by time. They're measured by performance. And so like when you focus on what coaches are able to do in terms of building up their their public relations, you know, their their popularity with their fans in terms of their performance recruiting and all that. The portal is essential at being able to allow coaches to like build up quickly and avoid the kind of things you see, like what happened with Louisville. Kenny Payne got, you know, really in trouble because his first uh, portal season, he didn't find any guards. He basically had one guard on his team, which was L. Ellis. And he basically he essentially had like six or seven forwards um, with one guard. And that's why that's one of the big reasons why that team suffered. So yeah, Bryce, I would say that, uh, you know, the old model is kind of leaking away, but it always was even before NIL, because again, I think just, you know, like what we talked about the chip stack theory, it's, it's been just sort of receding this focus on list, you know, the four years that are granted to a coach. And now it's just, okay, just, get us as many wins as you can because other teams are doing it, uh, you know, much faster. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be situational too, in so many ways. Like if you inherit a situation like Minnesota a couple of years ago and it was just nothing there and you give, you know, do you, you know, how, how often, how long do you give a coach to build that? And I think the two years might be enough with the portal as well as firing up recruiting. You know, it takes about two years to get your recruiting, younger players at a certain level, but at the same time you can come in and you can bring in, let's say you have six to seven roster spots. There's at least one guy that's sitting around that you could put in the game, you know, that, that that's from the old regime that you could feel like you could put into an eight rotate eight man rotation. Um, usually more than that. So if you're thinking eight man rotations, you know, you can go early on at seven in the portal that first year or two, and get a competitive group brewing and going, similar to what Tang did and Gates did. But, you know, it's, I think Mike's right about the patience factor, that it's going to be less a matter of, well, we got to get a year of not doing well. And this goes back to kind of Jacob's question. A year of not doing well, and then let's take a couple years to get these guys seasoned. And by their junior year, we're going to be hitting all cylinders. I think the expectation is going to be, let's get some juniors now yeah. and bring our freshmen along. And can you build a culture that keeps those first freshman classes in or keeps the guys you want in? Yeah. Um, and that's, again, we're going to talk a lot about that this summer, but I think you're, I think, I think Bryce, you're onto something with this question that, you know, that yeah. there, there is a, 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 a factor there. Yeah. And in the next pod, we'll, we'll go very deep into the portal and, you know, how teams are using it. So, all right. Um, anonymous ask uh, Mike, which bothers you more, the fact that your oldest brother is smarter and better looking or that he beat you in the family NCAA bracket? Please use as many pie charts and bar graphs as necessary to fully <laughs> illustrate your shame answer. Signed, Big Fan Anonymous in Terre Haute. So uh, thanks for writing in, Anonymous. Um, I will say that that phrasing, and that writing style sounds oddly familiar to me so yes i will confess uh, um it's true my my brother rob weemouth beat me in our family um uh, ncaa bracket pool um we both had in uh, we both had uconn winning um the championship but he edged me out on points in the early rounds uh, i think he benefited a little bit from uh, jamal shed uh you know suffering that injury yeah. i think uh that that was probably the the difference unfortunately so so i i, I humbly submit my my happy gilmore confession you know i'm stupid you're smart you're the best i'm the worst you know you're very good looking and i'm not very attractive so <laughs> yeah I, I, I when this when this airs i can just see him on his deck right right now <laughs> with a cigar just hitting re, re, replay on that part i just read right there he's going to just absolutely just like be kicking his feet you know enjoying that one so your, your brother you 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 guys are a hell of a lot nicer sir, than my brother and i are together you've and you've met the man we call the oh, house met, so. yes uh, yeah i've met matt of course many times so <laughs> yeah well just, i will say just a fr friendly plug speaking of my brother um rob actually uh co-founded a brewery in Terre Haute called uh, afterburner it's um it's a military owned um, sit-in brewery on 9th Street in, in Terre Haute. 
Um, he, he used to fly F-16s in the military. Um, actually, don't tell anyone, but he started out flying F-4 Phantoms because that's how old he is. But uh, I just drove Bennett by a museum piece we have of an F-4 Phantom in front of the airport here in Columbus. Really? Wow. You know, I think we used to fight the Kaiser with those planes, you know. So. <laughs> Ho Chi Minh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but he he start he started a brewery, brewery with some of his pals uh, from the base, and it's I will say it's awesome. I'm not like a huge beer guy, but his stuff is really good. It's um, it has five stars on Yelp, and it's really a cool place. And a lot of the Terre Haute locals just love it. It's um, you know it's definitely like a big hangout place. And when ISU was making their run, it was one of the the hopping uh, joints for uh, for the Sycamores That's run. Awesome. I'm actually drinking one of his uh, one of his beers right now. This is the um, I think the Midnight um, brew that they they have, and Rob sent me a sample of that. So. So yeah, so go check it out, um, and um, yeah, it's uh, there on Ninth Street in Terre Haute, and uh, yeah, Afterburner is a good place. And, oh, and by the way, uh, anonymous, uh, happy National Siblings Day too. So hope you're having a good one. <laughs> Same to you, Matt. <laughs> yeah. So Luke Hackworth asks, in you know, Bob, this one is for you. It's been 37 years since IU last won the NCAA championship. 34 years since the Reds won the World Series. As a fan of both myself. The level of urgency and desire to be on top again is at an all-time high. Are these two teams' destinies aligned? The Reds are a playoff contender this year with hopes of making the World Series in the next five years. Will the Hoosiers follow suit? Uh, as a kid that grew up in Columbus, Indiana, could get Channel 5 out of, out of, out of Cincinnati on the old antenna or cha- you know, Channel 4 watching IU games. Yeah, Luke and I, we both grew up as Reds and IU fans. Again, being born in 1975, uh, I was born right after IU lost to Kentucky, or right around that same time frame in that 75 year. And then the Reds won the World Series 75, and then IU 76, Reds again in 70. So when you kind of think about my early childhood, I knew nothing but sports success with the exception of the Bears. And even then, by 85, they were a contender. So... I would like to. I would say that it does feel like there's times where these, where the IU basketball program and the Cincinnati Reds are almost in a weird sort of like tandem. Yeah. Um, the big red machine. Oh, and I mean, I think Luke. You know, we all remember the '90 team at yeah. out of Cincinnati where they went wire to wire. And um, but and but did, like, yeah yeah I mean that that team but like I remember did the big red machine overlap with uh, like the seventy five seventy six team around there? yeah uh, that was right in the in in the in the prime in the middle where, where the Reds won the World Series they beat Boston in that infamous seven game job yeah, in yeah. seventy five okay and then in seventy six they swept the Yankees uh, when Steinbrenner you know basically was you know went, went and then and then the the Yankees won seventy seven seventy eight yeah. yeah. The Reds almost went to the World Series in 79, but Pittsburgh got them. That's back when they were in different divisions. Mm. And then there was a few years, the first three or four years, 80, 81, they were decent. They were good. 81, the best record in baseball, didn't make the playoffs. And then 82, 83, 84, they were terrible. And then Marge, the Marge years started, which are incredibly conflicting. It's kind of like, you know, it's the night years in a different direction for Reds yeah. fans. Yeah. There's a lot of complexities. Um, but, they, but they won in 88, right? Uh, they won in 90, 88. 90, okay. Yeah, 88. Uh, that was a year. That's they the they kept, they were prepared. Uh, that was, so the yes, Dodgers that was the Dodgers. Year. That yeah. was the Dodgers year. I think yeah. it was. Yeah, because yeah, in 89, the Reds then won. Uh, they, yeah, they, they, um, yeah, they, that, that's when the, that's when Pete yeah, was suspended for baseball. I've always wondered, you were a swimmer. Did you have, were your goggles like Chris Sabo goggles? No, Chris they were has. not. Um, oh, okay. It was, it was, that, we, that seems I, like I, a, lot, I that seems like a lost mine. opportunity was, there, there. Oh, uh, I remember Dissar, my best friend once, you know, he, you know, Sabo's rookie, you were playing whip ball in the backyard. He walked out with a pair of lawn goggles and played third base with his lawn goggles on. I mean, <laughs> it, whatever it, lurks, <laughs> but uh, honestly, I think it's, you know, both of them, it's interesting because it, Getting it together is always the question, and I think the fan, you know, if there's one thing that the, that that overlaps with these two, it's this whole idea of tradition. 
And if you've ever done opening day in Cincinnati, it's a thing. I mean, everything they, they have a they have a, they have a women's auxiliary, the Rosie Reds Club down there. That wow. you know they 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 give checks to little league teams, and the women are they show up in corsages. You got city council members in tuxes for opening day. It's like it it kind of kicks off the spring, and then you know it's kind of like the Indy Five Hundred. You know, ends it. So it, it's a special thing. But uh, I think I think. Yeah, as long as the you know, as long as the Reds stop trying to you know cheapen themselves up every three years by selling off the roster for beer beer cups, and and the like, they'll be fine. I think IU's got to kind of come to that conclusion too that it's like, okay, how do we create a perpetual winner and 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 use our advantages to what we have? Uh, the the one difference is one is definitely a small market team and one is definitely a big market team, and I think yeah. we know who what know the differences between the two there. Yep. And just financial resources available. So, Luke, thanks for the question, and uh, thanks to everybody for the questions. This was uh, this was a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah, no, I enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, it, I, it was funny when Jared suggested it. I was yeah. I was not even thinking about doing like an ask me, you know, ask us anything, uh, because I I always thought those were I won't say conceited, but I just don't have that in my brain thinking. Well, people obviously want to hear what I have to say, so let's just you know throw it open, you know. But yeah, I, I think this has been fun, and I think um, yeah, we'll try to do these every once in a while, maybe. I mean, not like a regular thing, but maybe every few months when maybe things are slow and people ask some questions, we'll you know open it up a bit. And I, I also like to just encourage. I, I love it when people are giving us feedback, um, especially you know Substack or the, you know, the the discords or just across the board. Um, it gives an idea of what you guys want to talk about, and it also helps spur yeah. us on going. We didn't really think of that, you know, and, and, you know, there's an episode in this question. There's an episode in this thought, like there've been a couple of times we've been, we've been interacting on, on one of the, one of the mediums and it's like, Oh, wait, um, (laughs) that wait, we can go further on this one. And, you know, part of the transfer portal conversation, I think Genesis from these conversations where it's like, yeah, how do you know, how do you know what sort of player you know, how, how is a play, you know, how can you look at a player at a mid major or a low major and translate them upwards yeah. and how do coaches know? And, you know, and, and how does it work? How does it not work? You know, that sort of thing. But yeah, it's, it, you know, so we really appreciate everybody and, and really just thanks for the, uh, our, our, we've closed our first season, I guess, you know, not season season, but our first uh, yeah. basketball first season. Basketball season. Yeah. And um, we'll do it. You know, we want again wants to say uh, a special thanks to John Ringer, not just for the question, but also the designs that you see on the show, and also for Bob Thompson for the sounds and music you hear as well. And uh, big thank and um, thank you, Mike. So yeah, absolutely no, thank you, Bob. It's been fun, and um, yeah, I, I, it's always good that we can uh, you know kind of break out. I think especially with with the summer coming, we can uh, mm-hmm. start to like uh, have a little bit more fun outside the context of like a specific basketball you know uh, conversations because we can always uh, we can always go on some uh, fun tangents here and there with uh, some of our other or <laughs> our other pastimes. <laughs> let's say, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think for next time, yeah, we're, we'll we'll discuss episode nine uh, two weeks from now. We'll we'll discuss the portal. We'll call it portal mania. We'll dive into the the portal transfers and discuss you know what's working, what's not. What are the big programs, the national relevant programs doing, and um, just kind of discuss the whole new landscape that uh, that the portal's providing for for all the programs. Um, and yeah, and also remember, like you know, th- th- this is mid April. And I guess today at noon, I guess the the uh, the window opened again as far as the uh, the dead period. So so yeah, the floodgates are going to come. Uh, last year, like April fifteenth around there was when like a slew of the big commits came came about. So just uh, be prepared. The next like seven days, you're probably going to see a lot of activity. So again, until then, um, this endless conversation was brought to you by the Back Home Network. Be sure to check out all the great BHN content including Assembly Call, Doing the Work, and Crimson Cast on YouTube and at backhomenetwork.com. Until next time, I'm Mike Remuth. And I'm Bob Motes. Have a good one, everyone.